Hello and welcome to this episode for Electric Pages. I'm your host, Robin Mitchell. Today we're here at Nuremberg Embedded World 2025 and we're at the Giga Device stand and I'm joined by a very interesting chap from Giga Device. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And without further ado, please tell the audience who you are, what you do and what you like to do in your free time. Okay, uh, I'm Lon House. I'm an FAE for Giga Device. My territory is the Americas. So travel a lot, visiting customers, helping them solve problems. Uh, in the free time when I'm not on an airplane, I generally uh, play drums and brew beer. Fantastic. So, and I hope that you're getting those air miles. Oh, I get all the air miles. Fantastic. Yeah. So we've got some really interesting stuff uh, here today. Now, it's not often that I go to a stand and see something. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. So let's start with this demonstration because I'm really curious as to what's actually going on. Okay. So this is based on our Cortex M7 MCU. This is our H7 family. It runs at 600 megahertz. And what we're doing here is an arc fault protection system. So oh. this is measuring current, right, in a industrial setting. And this we is have, be, so like your 400 volt plus kind of areas where you might get arc over between two. It can be, it can go yeah. as low as household voltage as well. Oh, that's true, yeah. That's true, so yeah. we have multiple channels here going into analog to digital converters. We're running a software AI algorithm that's looking for very specific voltage signatures mm. that tell you that you're experiencing an arc fault. Your response time to that is less than one millisecond. You have to shut the system down. So we're reacting very, very quickly to those changes. One millisecond. Less than one so millisecond. You're doing AI interference. Uh, sorry, AI interference on a chip. Within one millisecond, you can detect if there's an, a potential arc fault. Yeah. How? <laughs> that's. That's the secret of the AI, the training that we've done on the part. So it's looking for, you get an induced voltage, right, from the current flowing through here. There's a very specific signature that you see when an arc fault gets introduced. I'm, I'm guessing that because then you get a sudden change in current, you sort of see this kind of like instantaneous pattern. And that's, that's right. And that's what you're kind of looking for. That's right. The current and voltage are slightly out of phase. So you see the voltage spike following the current spike. Mm. And then as soon as we see that, we know that something has happened and we can tell the MCU to shut that channel down. That's, do you know, that's actually really cool. So I'm really kind of curious about the, um, about the training side of things. So how, how does the training work? So we have our own AI algorithm and software that we use. So the training that we've done was based on actual real world sampling. Hmm. So we generated arc faults over and over and over again, recorded that I information. I you were very popular with the engineers. Yeah, fortunately <laughs> that wasn't done in my office. Good, 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 good. <laughs> and, and, and so is this like a solution that customers can use or is it is it like an example of what a customer could do? It's both. So it's certainly an example of what you can do. That's what all of our demos are, or here are the things that are possible. But this is a reference design. So if a customer wanted to take this, they could do it themselves. put it in production, they are absolutely welcome to do that. So AI seems to be coming up everywhere. Yep. And microcontrollers, microprocessors, the whole lot, they all seem to be trying to put AI on edge. So my question to you is, uh, as the designers of the GD32 series, what was the biggest challenge that you found in trying to get an AI neural engine onto this chip? Uh, memory. Memory. Yeah, it's that getting getting it into the amount of RAM. Now this part has a megabyte of RAM, so yeah. we have a lot of memory to Which play is with. A lot for a small microcontroller. It is. Yeah. It is. But we really wanted it condensed because we can divide that RAM into tightly coupled memory. That's where we want to run the AI because it's running at zero weight state, or technically faster, because it's in the core complex. So that's where we want to run that algorithm. Yeah. So that means we need it really condensed to 512K or less. So that was the hardest part, was getting an algorithm that would fit, but would still be accurate. And so it's not just a case of a hardware challenge, it's also the software as well. That's right. So it's kind of like a, it's like a double whammy. You know? You're know, trying to build a chip that can do this, which already means you've got limitations, and then you're trying to then put an AI onto that, onto that hardware, and you're trying to solve the limitations of that as well. So it's, it's kind of like a two-in-one a two one sort of solution. It is. Yeah, that's exactly right. But now we have, on, on the back of this, we have this nice general AI solution that we can make applicable to other things. We're doing it in software because it's very, very portable. We can yeah. use it on a little bit smaller device if we need to for more cost effectiveness. Uh, oh, I see. So this is this is necessarily a case of like an AI neural engine that's working on it as, as like a specific uh, model. It, it, it's, you've done it in software entirely, so you don't need to have those extra components. Right. We're doing it all internally in the Flash and in the MCU here, yeah, that makes so sense. we can use it on a little bit smaller part if we need to. We yeah. can scale it down. And, uh, and again, customers can train their own models. That's right. 
That's fantastic. right. And we have the software and the expertise to help them do that. That's, that's fantastic. So it looks like we've got some other uh, demonstrations here. So let's start yep. with this nice big chunky energy storage inverter. Let's okay. have a look at this. So this, this, going on. this is a bi-directional energy inverter. So you have power coming in, you store it in batteries. When you need power to come back out, it goes back through the opposite path and can go back to the grid or wherever your point of use is. And, and to be very clear, mm -hmm. the um, when we say bi-directional, this isn't a case of having one, uh, uh, one sort of like one AC in, one AC out. This is a case of it can push and pull from the same AC cable, essentially. Right. So you would have a battery bank here. That's right. Yeah. And it would charge when it needed to, when it had power, say from solar or from the line, whatever. Yeah. And then when the power fails and you need to go the other way, it's the same piece of hardware that takes it right back out. Now, in this design, what exactly is it that the GD32 is doing? So we have two of our chips on here. So these are our newest uh, G553. So what we're doing is we're controlling the LLC, which is here. So your two inductors capacitors. We're controlling the buck boost converter, and we're also controlling the inverter and the power factor correction unit. So with doing that with these two MCUs, we can get over 90% efficiency. I was about to say, but by, by having it controlled by microcontroller, you can read those, you can read that data live in real time. It's a bit like maximum PowerPoint tracking. It's like you can, figure out, you can yeah. figure out exactly where you should be operating. Yep. And by, by doing that, you can maximize the efficiency of your design. That's exactly right. We, exactly. In fact, we do maximum PowerPoint tracking as well oh, on other things. The solar inputs yep. and stuff, yeah. So that's, that's why we're using these two parts here. They're 216 megahertz M33s with a tremendous amount of math hardware built into them. Mm. So it takes a lot of math to run. You've got a 100 kilohertz uh, LLC, you've got a 20 kilohertz PFC, mm. and you have to manage all of that. Um, I'm kind of being, uh, curious why you've got a two chip design. Because we can only we can't do this entire design on a single chip, because we're managing that 100 kilohertz LLC. I see. So we're doing conversion, then we're doing rectification, we're doing conversion again. And I'm guessing that by separating it, it also helps make sure that you can get those sort of uh, very fast response time. That's making, exactly right. Because if you try and run everything on one device, it doesn't matter how big that device is, it's probably going to struggle if it's trying to do two things at once. That's and exactly this, and this right. is something that you really want to probably keep quite separated. Yes. So that, that actually makes a lot of sense. I, no, I like it. I like it. What is this? So this is a keypad. It's our L235, which is our low power MCU family that has USB built into it. So what we've done is just created a simple USB keyboard that you can plug into a smartphone. It has all the keys on it, but it also has shortcuts for screenshots and things like that. And so I'm guessing the purpose of this demonstration is to show the USB capabilities. That's correct. Exactly. It's a low power, low cost MCU, but it also has USB. So what kind of low power are we talking about here? Uh, so on this part, we have 10 different power modes. Typically, ARM provides four. That's a lot of power modes. It is, but it lets you start shedding loads while you're still doing things. And, it, and I'm guessing it gives you more freedom in terms of exactly what you want to do. Because I'm guessing if you have like a four or three power modes, it's kind of like either everything's kind of off or nothing's off. And what you're trying to do is get that kind of fine granular control. That's right. Yeah. So we have three different deep sleep modes on here. And as you're getting deeper in sleep, you're, you're doing things like shutting different parts of RAM down. Yeah. You know, so you're saving more power. We have low power timers. We have a low power UART. Those can be used to wake the device up, but they have very, very low current drain while the device is in sleep mode. So you've put in 10 different sleep modes, which mm -hmm. tells me that you must have had talks to customers and they must have said to you, well, we need different types of sleep. So what would you say was the biggest challenge that customers said to you about sleep modes? What was it that they were looking for? Um, the two things that are the most challenging are going to sleep and maintaining your RAM, mm -hmm. because those are... You have to keep it refreshed. Yeah. And the more RAM you keep, the more power you're spending. So yeah. it's, it's finding that crossover point. Then it's also wake up time. So wake up time, as you go deeper and deeper to sleep, your wake up time takes longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. So you have to balance how long do I have to wake yeah. up and service something versus how much power do I need to save? So the RAM that you have on these chips, is it static RAM or is it dynamic RAM? It's static it's RAM. Static. And, so, mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of curious, it's, I've never actually asked this question, but I've always wondered, it, could, static RAM versus dynamic RAM, which one uses more power? I was guessing it would be dynamic. It would be dynamic. It depends on the amount of memory. Right. So static RAMs are typically much smaller than dynamic RAMs, right? right? Dynamic RAMs are going to get up into yeah. megabytes. Right. Of course. Static yeah, RAM, yeah. we get into a megabyte, 
but we don't really go into megabytes as mm -hmm. as such because it's, the, it's expensive memory. It's, it's, the cells are bigger. Yeah. Right. So it takes more Six board transits, space. I think it is. So it's, I think you're right. Yeah. Think, so it's and then inverters sort of like back to back. So <laughs> and you've got the capacitance that you have yeah. to you know. Yeah. And with DRAM, you're getting all that that nice refresh signal coming in, so you don't. So we yeah. do use some some pseudo uh, some some pseudo static RAMs that are semi dynamic, and, and that will, those are options that you can do external to the microcontroller if you need to boost up your. We have one family that has those built in. Oh, it really? has four megabytes of that oh, built wow. in. Yeah, oh, so wow, that's, that's designed for like laser printers and things. Yeah. that need a huge amount of RAM. You just got to you just got to like store it somewhere while you're working, but it, but this, again, the speed and access isn't as important in terms of like compared to the main static RAM. That's, that's right. That's servicing your program. Yep. So we've got one more demonstration here, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. Tell me what's going on. Okay, so this again has two of our microcontrollers built in. This has our F5 family MCU here, which is one of our, our newest, more powerful ones. Um, that's Ooh, it's RISC V. Oh, no. that's the wireless part. Oh, wait, so that's the wait, other MCU. Wait, that one there? Yeah, so we oh. make this module as well. So we have our general purpose microcontroller here that's handling all the energy monitoring. Yeah. This you can bring in through your ADCs to do current monitoring, things like that. I, I had no idea that uh, uh, Giga Device did um, wireless. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, this is our second generation of oh, wireless really? parts. We started with Wi-Fi 4. Mm -hmm. This part has BLE 5.2 and Wi-Fi 6 Excellent. built in. Excellent. So it gives you, you know, the option of uh, Wi-Fi 6 has some really nice features for the embedded side where you can have stateless protocols and things like that. There's only one antenna pin on here, so the hardware inside handles the multiplexing between the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So you run a Bluetooth stack and you run a Wi-Fi stack, and you never know that they're interleaving because the hardware handles that for you. So we can potentially cut this bit out because I'm going to ask you a question. In okay. terms of the footprint, is it yep. similar to the ESP32? Because I'm, I'm getting real ESP32 vibes here. Well, it's yes. We have one part that is very similar to an ESP32 family. Mm -hmm. This is our kind of medium sized module. Mm -hmm. We have one that's much smaller than that. Mm -hmm. It's about 12 by 15 millimeters. Oh, that's tiny. With the built in antenna. With the built in antenna. With the built in antenna. Same functionality. So the only difference in our three modules is the number of I.O. pins that you have yeah. available and the mounting technology. Mm. These are surface mount, but they're castellated pins, so you could hand solder this. Oh, of course. The mini one is an LGA, so it has to be machine placed. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Because well, yeah, ESP32, I mean, they're huge in the market. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where we're going with and, this, and, right? And of course, as an engineer, because I mean, the ESP32 is something I use a lot, but I also like the Giga device range, especially the 32 family, because it's, it's all STM, it's compatible with STM32 devices. Yep. So, and so I'm sitting there thinking, if I want to port my software over to, uh, to G, the GD32 range, and then you're bringing out a wireless sock as well, I'm thinking, if I can replace the ESP32 and have it all into one family, mm -hmm. that's something I, I that, that really sort of like ticks a lot of my boxes, which is why I'm asking, like, are they, Pin compatible, or are they, you know, footprint compatible, or yeah. So our our design strategy when we started making MCUs was to build them to be pin compatible with SD Micro and register compatible. We're to a degree, yes. to a degree, yes. Because that's one of the things I love the most: the fact that the register basically it's all the same address, which is like, oh, it just does, you, you don't really change your software at all. That's right. You so, have if you've written it at a low enough level, yeah, you can run a binary on both parts. That mm -hmm. is possible, mm -hmm. and we do have customers that do that. Yeah. As we've grown, we've created some special features in our UARTs and yeah. things that that ST doesn't and, offer. And with the introduction of the Risk Five architecture as well, that's just yep. that means everything's open source. It means it's 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 easy for you guys to innovate faster yep. than trying because because I know I know I know that a lot of other microcontrollers tend to use other architectures which we won't refer to. Yeah. Um, and 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 that does limit people in terms of what they can do with that architecture. So it's nice to see more and more companies like Giga Device taking advantage of Risk Five. So before we wrap up this uh, video, before we uh, sorry, did that one more time. Sorry. So before we wrap up this video, I've got one more question for you. Sure. For the audience who are watching this, if they want to get involved with Giga Device and the new range of GD32 devices, mm -hmm. what would you recommend that they do? So our webpage is the easiest place to go. It's gigadevice.com, easy enough to find. Uh, there are links there to all of our parts. There are links there by country to all of our salespeople who can put you in touch with engineers or anyone else you need to get in hold of. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to see us. Thank today. you. I appreciate it. Thank you.